Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight and our, let's say, soft relaunch of the AR Talks, our developer and technology focused um, event series. And I'm really glad that we could kick it off with a partner like Niantic. Tonight with us is Michael Furman. He's a, a research scientist, senior research scientist hello, um, at Niantic, and will tell us all about the Lightship AR development kit, which has, is now in beta. And for all of us who don't know me and us, Next Reality, we are a nonprofit association who tries to connect all players who could, or who are actually working in the XR industry already uh, could potentially benefit from using XR technologies. Um, yeah, we are really happy um, to have these kinds of events. Usually we would have done all this in real life, um, which is well, because of obvious reasons not possible at the moment. And sadly, most of you are probably already used to that. If you want to know more about Next Reality, our work from podcast to content to events, of course, or our annual award, please check out nextreality.hamburg. And yeah, so I'm actually looking really forward to what Michael will present us because I'm slightly obsessed with Niantic products and I'm really curious and excited about um, the technology that lies underneath it all and what Lightship ARDK will offer, especially our developer community in terms of opportunities. So Michael, uh, the stage is yours. Oh, like one more second. Um, the evening will be like this. Michael will tell you all he wants to tell you about um, to, uh, regarding the lightship ARDK. And then we'll have a Q&A session. So don't be afraid and hesitate to ask some questions. And if some people of you after will still feel like it, we can have networking breakout sessions, which are quite nice. So, but only if there are enough people left after the Q&A session. But that's kind of the, it feels like real networking somehow, like mixing up or mingling at a bar and uh, just talking in small random groups. Um, so that's just an offer, but uh, that will be the program for tonight. So Micah, now the stage is yours. And I'm looking forward to your presentation. Superb, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm Michael and um, yeah, I'm a research scientist at Niantic and I work in the uh, London office and the goal of the work that we do is to come up with new algorithms for augmented reality and ultimately implement augmented reality algorithms to, to go into the phone, to be used in games and ultimately the Lightship platform. So some of the things I showed today have been things that I've been working on. Um, but I have to say that most of them are things I haven't been working on, so I can't take the credit for, um, you know, 99% of what you will see. Today I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about Niantic, where Niantic's come from, and so it's sort of brief history, um, and then the Lightship platform in general. Um, but I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the ARDK, the Augmented Reality Development Kit. Um, we've got lots of fun kind of demos and videos. And at the end, I think we should have lots of time to have questions and discussion. I think I'm really keen just to talk about what people think about it, but also like people's general thoughts on AR, you know, where it's going, what, what, what are we missing, what, what should we be working on, and so on. But um, as promised, we start with a history lesson. Um, Niantic, people think of Niantic as this sort of games company, but really it began as a mapping company. So 20 years ago, um, the founders of Niantic actually started a different company called Keyhole, which was a mapping company um, dealing with, you know, digital versions of maps and um, satellite views. And this was acquired by Google. And this technology became Google Earth, Google Maps. And, um, and you know, the, the founders continued to work on this. But after some time, they decided they wanted to get back into gaming. They were originally from, from various gaming companies. And so they founded Niantic Labs within Google. Um, it was spun out a few years later. And then a year after that was, you know, the famous summer of um, Pokemon Go um, in 2016. Um, and since then, Niantic's continued to launch um, games. Um, and 
now is kind of a next big step, which is launching the technology behind all those games. So everything that we've kind of created to make these, these games, um, we're now opening up for other developers to create their own games on top of that platform. So that's kind of where we've come from. Um, and I'll talk a bit now about what, what kind of Niantic is all about. Um, I think Niantic's key goal is this, it's to inspire people to explore the world together. Um, and this is a nice picture, it's sort of a, a go first, obviously from a, a few years ago now, but lots of people coming together to do exactly that, to explore and to do it all together. Um, and there are three pillars of this kind of overall goal, exploration and discovery. So people kind of going out and, and finding interesting things in the real world. Um, so there's a, this is a, um, you know, I think nearly 13 million places around the world as people have kind of, you know, yeah, player curated places like, hey, this is an interesting place and, and we should care about this, places that other people should visit. This is kind of nice, um, particularly like if you're into geocaching and things like that, it's very much, you know, that digital version of like, hey, there are these real places that we should visit. Uh, movement. Um, this is like really big principle. Um, and I think kind of users appreciate this motivation to get outside and move around. Like you play the game and without realizing it, suddenly you realize you've, you've walked your 10,000 steps. Um, and that's kind of cool. And it's obviously there's big benefits there from movement for like physical and mental well-being. Um, and the amount of collective steps or kilometers is, is enormous. And so I think this, this figure here, um, 28 billion kilometers walked collectively with Niantic Games, something like Earth to the Moon and back 36,000 times, something like that is, is, is enormous. You know, there's a, so much walking around the globe happening and it does happen that, you know, you sometimes see someone else who's kind of really on a mission somewhere and you think they're late for their train, but actually they've got, um, you know, Pokemon Go open and they're, they're trying to get something. It's kind of fun to see. Um, real world social, the third and most, most recently the hardest pillar. Um, but, you know, I think we're getting to a stage where soon we can start to do this again, start to get people um, out together. And, and so we're going to talk later about some technology that really kind of makes this fun. Um, but definitely getting people together in the same place to, to play games together is kind of something that we, we care about. So, um, you know, that's, that's a... That's kind of the third, the third point. And this is, you know, it's, um, it's cheesy. I think it, though it is the kind of the thing that underpins it is, it underpins the whole of augmented reality actually is that we're not trying to create a separate world. We're trying to sort of augment the real world. We're kind of adding stuff to it. The real world's already fun. So let's just add some of our own fun stuff to it. Um, these are those same three pillars, just with different stock photos. And, um, you know, it's, it's nice. Let's go and explore and um, move around and meet people in real life. Okay, so um, I mentioned uh, Pokemon Go, which I think is probably the most famous of uh, Niantic's games. But there was Ingress before that. There was actually Field Trip before that, which isn't mentioned here. Um, and since then, Harry Potter, um, Catan game, got Pikmin, uh, Heavy Metal coming up. Um, and all of these are, so Heavy Metal is a Transformers based game, by the way, if you haven't heard of that. Um, these all rely on kind of a shared underlying technology stack, and that's what's being packaged up in Lightship. Um, and you can see there's things here, there's like, there's obviously the gameplay, but there's a social element, like, hey, let's, let's make friends and, um, and, and share things with each other. There's um, mapping um, and there's the ARDK, which I'll talk more about. So there's lots of stuff going on in this slide, but I mean, key thing is that along the bottom, there's loads of stuff in Lightship. If you're making a game that's kind of like Pokemon Go, um, you'll probably want all of these things because there's stuff like anti-cheat mechanisms, which are so important for um, games where you're um, which rely on people visiting real world places. You don't want someone just spoofing GPS locations and, and, and winning the game. Um, and also obviously things like geospatial, um, you know, the game servers and so on. But also this big block on the left 
is the ARDK. So everything to do with augmented reality on your Canva feed. Um, and that's a big part of Lightship. And I think that um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So the, all that stuff in gray I won't talk about, but it, it also exists. That's also coming out in Lightship. Okay, so um, like with our, um, our core mission values, which are three pillars, there's also um, three pillars of Lightship. Um, but I think the key overall thing of Lightship is, um, and ARDK, is that it's cross-platform. So, you know, you build once and then you can deploy it to iOS or Android, as you see um, fit. But um, there's also a whole, just a whole toolkit of stuff to make AR experiences. And um, the important thing is it's all in Unity. So if you're happy in Unity, you'll be happy with ARDK. If you're not happy in Unity, then it's probably not the thing for you. But I think most people are, um, are pretty, pretty uh, keen on using that. Then the AR capabilities are in these three buckets. There's the sharing, so um, real-time multiplayer, which I'll talk about in a minute. There's understanding the world. This is kind of about what's going on around me right now. Can we do some AR effects that kind of um, that work with the real world that I'm seeing? And finally is mapping, so tying digital content to real world locations. And I'll talk about that last of all. Okay, so we'll talk about sharing first. Um, and the key technology here is multiplayer. So this is multiplayer augmented reality. And the idea is that you can play games with each other and you share an AR experience. You're in the same place and you're seeing the same things at the same time. So I think this is a little demo here, which is kind of fun. Um, it's kind of a like, uh, a kind of a battle based um, thing. I played an early version of this kind of um, thing a couple of years ago, and it was really fun to do then. Um, it, it takes some kind of, um, it takes some skill to, to kind of make these experiences that really work well with other people. Like maybe when they're super simple, they work the best. The one I played a couple of years ago was just like firing lasers at other people. Um, but it's really fun. And the idea is that the technology that underpins it is all about sharing not only the locations of all the different players, but also the game states, the AR states, um, and it's all done super fast. Um, so it, so you don't get this kind of latency and lag. Let's go to the next slide here. This is another example where it's um, collaborative rather than combative. Um, and it's kind of fun. It's like two people who are jointly building a planet, they're doing terraforming, so they're building kind of seas and, um, and land on this planet, and you can kind of see here how their the phone locations of these two people is being communicated back to this, um, this witness camera, which is viewing both of them. So this was made by an external developer. Um, external developer company Trigger, Trigger Global in this sense. And I think a lot of these videos are made by external companies. So it's kind of cool that all this stuff is being tested out and stress tested, debugged um, as we go. Um, so it's nice because now when it kind of gets launched um, in beta now, it's already undergone that first stage of testing. So we kind of problems which come up, we're, we're ironing out and we're doing that now. This one is fun but it, I don't think it translates well to video, so I'll have to describe it. Um, it is, it's a shared um, audio experience. So it's this idea that you can be in the same space with someone and you can leave AR objects, you can place them in the space, and these AR objects make sound as you move around them. And because you're in the same shared space, you can kind of leave objects for your friends to encounter. Um, and you can make the kind of a soundscape. Um, and you can imagine this is the sort of thing that works really well with nice like headphones um, and you get this real like audio augmented reality, um, which I think is, is really cool. And it's kind of just the kind of unusual thing that you can do, which you don't think of as being like the first thing you could do with this kind of technology. So yeah, I mean, it's, it translates 
badly to video, it'll be even worse over over Zoom. Um, but I think it's a, it's just a really nice um, idea. And again, this was made by an external um, company. Okay. Right. So that was um, the sharing killer. That was the uh, the multiplayer um, multiplayer AR. And, and that's available as part of a Lightship beta. So if you want to try that out, then sign up at the end and you can get access to that. Um, and that's, that's quite a sort of, you know, as I say, it was around a couple of years ago internally to Niantic. So it's definitely quite a um, mature part of it. Understanding reality. This is the kind of the pillar that I work in. So, um, so I have um, more sort of, um, that's what should I say, like uh, more of an insight into the, the actual technology itself um, going on here and also more of a critical eye when, when things aren't doing what I want it to be doing um, on some of these videos. But this kind of covers, there's lots of technology inside this pillar. The, um, the first is the depth API. So this is giving you a depth map for every frame in your camera feed. Um, and you don't need LiDAR for this. So it's, you know, can run on basically any phone from the last few years. Um, and this, one of the things you can do with this is occlusion. And so we've got an occlusion um, uh, framework built into ARDK. So you can occlude um, these, these virtual objects when they pass behind real world objects. Then semantic segmentation. This is about knowing what's what in your camera feeds belongs to which class of object? You know, am I looking at some ground or some buildings? Am I, is it the sky? Is it a person? And so on. Um, and finally, meshing. So this is about generating a persistent model of your environment. So here's an example of a demo that uses, in this case, meshing. So it's kind of cool. It's just like, again, quite simple, but it's creating these little targets you to throw your snowballs through. And it's nice kind of thinking about what meshing is actually being used for here. Um, it's being used for, I think, primarily two things. One is the collisions. So when these snowballs hit the floor or hit the table, they make splats in the right place and they bounce off in the right place. But the other thing is actually for the placement of these hoops. So you you want to place these hoops in empty space. You don't want to place them kind of inside an object or behind a wall. So it's kind of the things that you don't initially think about, but which are actually really important to that AR experience to keeping it believable and real. Right? Let's go now to thing. Yes, so these are some um, demos these all just use depth. They don't use meshing, but I think the, the kind of updated versions of these do use meshing now. On the left, we're using um, a kind of path planning um, scenario. So this little Yeti creature, um, who is Niantic's uh, company mascot, is walking around the scene. And the path that it's going on is being determined by our understanding of the shape of the, of the environment. So it knows it can't walk through a wall. It can't walk off the edge of a pier into the water. So it has some understanding of what's going on and the fact that it you know, can't walk into that person because there's a, there's a, there's a, a thing there. Um, so this kind of realistic path planning is what this is showing. In the middle, it's a graphics effect, this kind of lighting effect. There's all these kind of things you can do with just, um, just by kind of knowing something about the shape of the scene. Um, and this sort of thing is, is very cool because it's, um, it's the sort of thing that you just can't do when you don't have that knowledge of the shape of the scene. And this is the sort of, we never thought, so I was part of a team that originally created these, this depth estimation um, technology. And we kind of thought, hey, this is cool for occlusions. Yeah, that's fun. Um, you know, here you go, and gave it to some technical artists, and they came up with stuff like this, and it's just incredible, like, the, the ideas that people have and can, can come up with, and we're just showing a few of them here, but this is another one, again, just using depth in this case, but meshing would work well here, too, um, and it's, it's like just bouncing these, these virtual objects off the real world. Again, just a, a fun little thing, but just it, without knowledge of the shape of the world, this would be so unimmersive 
and it would really break that illusion. Uh, the next thing I'll show you is not what that video is showing now, but it's semantic segmentation. So this is about knowing which pixels in your image belong to what categories. And it's a short video, so I'll show it again. So here it's showing, hey, all these red pixels here are sky. All these ones down here, that's ground. And um, over there, you've got buildings. And down there, you've got foliage. So we've got um, a load more categories coming up. These four we've released. They kind of go through an internal QA process. Um, but there should be a load more coming out, you know, over the coming months. We've got, I think, internally, we've got, I don't know, there's more than this. Um, and there's kind of fun stuff you can do with it. I can't show you the video on the left because I don't have access to it. Um, but it's kind of fun. It's like using sky segmentation to place a, um, a giant creature behind the buildings. So it really looks like it's being occluded by these buildings. So that's using sky. Um, and on the right, this is fun. It was made by an external um, developer. And it's just a really simple gameplay mechanism, which is collecting resources from real world objects. So if you point your phone at a tree, you can collect wood. Um, and if you point it at, you know, um, the sky, you can collect clouds. You can imagine doing this for any number of semantic categories, like, hey, go and find a flower, and you can get some, like, flower tokens, um, which is really nice, I think. So this is, uh, let's see that again. It's just like, find the tree, you're kind of going on a little scavenger hunt, and you find it, and then you can collect these resources. There's obviously loads of other stuff you can do, particularly like the graphics effect like we showed with um, the lights. Um, you could kind of do similar things like graphics effects from different semantic categories um, or getting you know, points for finding semantic categories. Or maybe you have AR creatures that only spawn when you see certain semantic categories. It's kind of like there's loads of stuff. It's, you know, it's basically endless what can be done with this kind of thing. Um, the, the final part of this understanding branch is meshing. And the overall idea of meshing is to build up a 3D map of your environment. So as you move through it, you're building up a, um, a mesh. It's a, it's a voxel mesh, which is then converted to a mesh. Um, and you can use this just like you would any mesh um, inside Unity um, or of any other effect you want. And so an example on the right is where it's, the mesh is being used to place these kind of um, these vines, these, these plants over the mesh um, in a procedural geometry. But mesh is also great for, um, for doing like collisions, um, you know, jump physics based things, also placement. If you're thinking, hey, where can I place certain AR objects? I want to place an AR um, castle and it's, you know, it's this big. Where's a place in the scene I can put it? When you have the mesh, that sort of thing becomes much simpler. And if you're trying to just guess um, or use kind of the more um, primitive kind of plane detection that's in the underlying um, AR kit and AR core. So the mesh is super fun. Um, and again, this is coming out in the Lightship beta. So that's, um, that's the understanding pillar. Um, I'm definitely keen to talk more about this if people have questions about it. Um, as I am about everything here, but, you know, that's the, that's the bit that I, I, I personally have done the most work on. Um, and mapping, the mapping team is kind of our cousin team to the research team. And this is a really fun um, piece of technology. Um, uh, one of Niantic's missions we saw is about kind of inspiring people to explore this world and do it together. Um, and it kind of makes sense to do this, having a, a digital map of the world makes a lot of sense. So you you kind of you you're not just placing things like arbitrarily, but you have this very um, tight 3D copy of the world. And as I said at the start, Google um, Niantic is really a mapping company, um, which became Google Maps. So this is kind of in the the uh, Niantic founders is kind of in in them to to be mapping. So this is kind of the the overall aim is to build this 3D map, this digital twin of the physical world. And you might think, hey, we kind of have that already. Like, you know, there's Google Earth, they've got some 3D reconstructions. 
But I think this is very different to that. And I think this is for these three key reasons. Um, firstly, the aim is to be up to date. So as the real world changes, so to do the, does this digital map of the world. So it really reflects what's happening. It's crowdsourced, so it can be updated all the time. The second is that it isn't just a map for looking pretty, but it's a, it's a map that, that is able to do visual positioning service, uh, localization. So you pull your phone out of your pocket and you don't just know roughly where you are, which GPS would give you, but you know exactly where you are. Your phone's position and orientation down to a few centimeters. And then making use of this, there's content anchoring capabilities. So the ability to place virtual content on the real world in a specific place and then to return to the real world at any point in the future and find that same thing. And you can imagine this virtual content could be placed by a game creator. You could create a game experience in a specific location in the world, um, but it could also be placed by players of the game. So for example, like the audio AR experience I showed earlier, you could imagine people in the game creating these kind of audio soundscapes for other people to listen to. And this, the caveat I have to give here is that this mapping stuff isn't in the beta at the moment. We've got it working internally um, and it's, you know, you can imagine the, the stress testing that goes through it, like, because it needs to work um, in all these different real world locations. And I think a key kind of differentiator of this um, Niantic 3D map is the idea that it's crowdsourced. So we've got millions of players um, playing our games. We're really happy to go out and, um, and make small contributions to this map in return for rewards in the game. And this means we're able to keep this map really up to date. Of course, we're getting this user data. So there's like this big um, thing around privacy, if you take those seriously. So, uh, you know, we operate in loads of different countries and we use the highest standard of privacy of all of those countries and we, we apply that worldwide. So um, these images that come in are all scrubbed, they're all anonymized, they have all this like personal, like, personal information uh, removed from them. And ultimately what we end up, end up with is just a 3D model of that part of the world. A 3D model of this, um, you know, I, I don't know what this is, maybe a, a, a sort of out sculpture on the outside of a building. And we end up with this kind of 3D model on the right, um, which other players can then um, localize against. So again, other players never see this, this underlying structure, but they can use it to, to fuel their kind of game experience. So that's the idea of the map. Um, and then I did promise that this map would then be used to localize against. It's no good having a map like this if you can't then use it for something. Um, and that's exactly what the VPS is for. Um, it's aiming for centimeter precision here. As I said, you, you can point your phone at something. Here it's um, uh, Westminster Abbey, I think. And, and you know where exactly where you are. You know where you are in the world and you can then see that kind of, that, that anchored content. Um, so yeah, this, you know, the contributions to the map is obviously by the app users, um, people playing these games but also the developers themselves. And I think that's a key point. For example, if you're developing a game, which you need to work really well in a certain area of the world, um, you could actually go out and map it yourself with this app. You could say, I'm, I want this to work well in Trafalgar Square. So I will go and map Trafalgar Square. And I know now that my game will work well in this space. Got a, uh, a demo video here of like an early version of this um, technology. So it's taking a whole load of photos to build, and this is now the 3D map that you see here, this kind of very sparse collection of points. I think we're now doing this densely, so we actually have a dense map, which is actually looks much um, cooler. Um, and the idea is that you can then retrieve 3D content, which has been placed there, in this case by the, the game designer, who's placed this balloon in the middle of this um, hallway. And so, you know, and join a different session. Someone else can join the same game and see the same stuff, which is fun. 
yeah so let's do that one more time let's say um it's, this kind of indicates the scanning process all these photos are being used to build this map which is what happens on the, the servers um, and then when someone then pulls their phone out and and points it at the world there's a short localization step and then you're you're localized you know where you are and then you've got your digital content overlaid on the world. Okay. Obviously, there's massive um, problems here around scale, like scaling this up to world scale is, um, is enormous. So it's, it's good that we've got lots of great people who know how to do that. Um, because you know, making something in one location is one thing, but scaling that up is enormous. Um, so this is kind of a recap. There's loads of words here so don't read those just look at the kind of i think that they're like the orange blocks are the important things those are all coming out in the beta release um and the out along the bottom are the gray things which are not yet out in beta release so they're going to be coming like next year um is vps stuff this is all stuff that we're kind of working on internally um and will be released in the future. I think we're nearly there, actually. You can, uh, this is the important bit. You can apply to join the beta. So go to niantic.dev and just sign up. Um, even if you don't care about it right now, but you might just sign up and you will. Um, and I think, yeah, if you say nextreality.hamburg in the use case in the comments, um, then you will, um, I don't know, I don't know what happens then. Oh, some magic happens. You're probably prioritized, I thought. Um, that would be nice, wouldn't it? And um, yes, so please join there. You can um, also contact me if you're, if you're interested and you want to know more about the work that I do. Um, please just, just get in touch and um, I'm very happy to answer questions about that. But that's everything I have today for the presentation. So now um, I suppose we go over to questions and I'm very happy to have any discussions, questions that anyone has. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, it's been really interesting. Um, we already have some questions in the chat. Um, oh, fantastic. Um, so Michael, are you utilizing a R core or a R kit somehow, or are those features completely developed by Niantic? What are the biggest differences between Lightship and AR core and AR kit dev environments? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So in terms of the AR experience, we definitely do draw upon AR core and AR kit. And the most obvious of those is for camera pose, because that's something very like close to the metal using their IMU sensors. Um, and that's something that Google and Apple do pretty well, not perfectly, but pretty well. Um, I think the key difference between what we do and what, what they do is that our technology is designed around this kind of gameplay. The kind of gameplay that we want is like, hey, we want to make a creature like run around the room in front of us. Whereas AR Core and AR Kit, I'm trying to be much more general purpose. I think it's more like, okay, we're going to give you camera pose and some other things, um, but it's not designed around this kind of gameplay. Um, I think there are, there are other technical differentiators, um, you know, and some of these things, like some of the technology we have here, like does, does things, you know, it, you can't do the meshing, for example, doesn't come from these other things. If you want to do get depth from Apple, you have to buy a LiDAR enabled phone. Um, so, you know, there are, there are all these things and the point that we try to be very cross-platform, really offering the same things, no matter what platform you're on. Um, which, and that's actually a tremendous amount of work, but it makes development so much easier. So, so I think it's all of those things. So next question would be, what does 3P developer mean? Ah, yeah, that's a really <laughs> good question. So that is third party developers. Yes. So that was not, that should be, um, um, that should be actually just written out in full because otherwise, how is anyone going to know? Third party developer. So it's um, what the slide said was um, the ARDK enables third party developers to create, sustain, and deploy immersive AR experiences. So it's all about people outside of Niantic using this platform. 
So that's anyone else? So this was all the questions we collected in the chat. If anyone else has a question for Michael, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask straight away. Or maybe raise your hand first. There's this lovely hand feature so we can coordinate this a bit. So um, you can find the hand feature, I think, down somewhere. Uh, so um, both, has, both has raised hands. Yes. So who is uh, it? Wolf. Can can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I saw the presentation in in some other webinar, uh, and I'm I'm st still waiting for good news on the on the mapping stuff. <laughs> you said next yeah. year. So because uh, uh, we we would like to use it for. Um, uh, I don't know, a participation of citizens in building uh, processes, or communal stuff. So this is this is the idea we want to make. So we we need we need the uh, persistence thing. Um, mm -hmm. Will you will you support um, standards that uh, institutions like OpenAR Cloud are developing, so that um, there could be providers for. A mapping providers for content, so it's not all in one one silo. It's a, it's an open, um, an, yeah, an, an open system. So it's it's not you don't have to be in Google in Niantic, whatever tied there. Yeah, I think this is a really good point. I don't actually know the answer to this. Um, I think I don't know about the that level of openness um, of like sharing the do you in, in this sort of open AR cloud is it kind of sharing the underlying maps is it is that the kind of the how that works yeah open AR cloud is is a non-profit organization that tries to get companies and organizations to talk to each other and develop those standards as open standards like the Kronos group or, or someone like that or mm -hmm. um, so uh, they they in they brought in the idea of uh, to the, um, I, I don't know the exact name of the organization, it's defining the standards for coordinates. Um, yep. And there, there are several, uh, so it's a standardization organization, I just can't remember the name of it at the moment. Um, but uh, we, we're putting in there, um, the idea is to have uh, six, six stuff uh, uh, poses. <laughs> they only think of 3D. So, yep. um, and we need uh, at least six stuff and, and, and may, uh, maybe more. Um, so um, it, it would be very nice if, uh, yeah, if Niantic jumps in and <laughs> uh, makes the, its standard and services uh, open. So nobody has to be in, in one of the companies. He, he can select, because you, you said, okay, privacy. Yeah. I, I think if you're really doing persistence, who's allowed to, we, we saw it with Street View activities in, in, in Google. And since we're in Germany, <laughs> you know, Germany is kind of aware of those things and privacy. Not always it does make sense. Sometimes it makes sense. Um, and so uh, to get technology like, like this in, in operation uh, in, a, in a broad sense to people, to commerce, to um, public, public things, I think um, this is the most important thing. It has to work out well and on technology side, but I think the privacy stuff is the most important. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's why, you know, so that's why it's taken so seriously. I think, in fact, you know, we probably could have had mapping it out by now if we hadn't have sort of paused for such a long time to really work out and just like the yeah. scale of things like anonymization um yeah. is is just so so vast but you're absolutely right about I, I think i understand more now the the idea of this like um keeping to the same formats on open ar um and if you send me an email um well i will um i'll ask people internally what kind of what's being done on that i think it's um i suppose the main thing is that you care about that is about having like standardized coordinate systems and standardized location systems is that kind of a thing so you can then switch between providers yeah providers of localization technology providers of content and all those levels so it's um there's uh, something called the open spatial computing platform but not in the sense of providing a platform by the organization 
uh, but to uh, have the same structure and li like OpenXR. So you, you have some horizontal layers yeah. and you can exchange uh, whatever uh, the device layer or the, uh, the content layer or the localization layer. Um, if, if, you, if there's the reason for you, you and yeah, so it's open to a more, more, um, more of those uh, of the systems. And I think that this, because if we only have some companies, because Google can, did and can do a lot of stuff, you're coming out of Google, so you probably know much better than me, uh, but I'm kind of afraid. And I think there are a lot of people uh, that, that want to know that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. I, I will write an email if you don't mind. And, yeah, and yeah, please do. Give an answer. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you for organizing, Simon, uh, Farina. <laughs> Sarah. Yeah, uh, it's always a pleasure to, to have these kinds of events, to yeah, have that kind of exchange, which is really important to push the industry further. Anyone else with a question, something on your mind? Don't be shy. Um, can you hear me, guys? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, Michael, um, today we can see that we have much more uh, powerful devices. Um, if that's uh, an iPad Pro, for example, using Binary or anything else with um, more possibilities in utilizing artificial intelligence and so on. Um, what are, are you also enhancing um, visual quality in your um, researches, let's say, in your developments in the future? Um, and if yes, in what direction are you going? Maybe uh, real-time uh, global illumination rendering or something? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And definitely at the moment, we are shipping one version of a platform for everybody so while there's some minimum phone requirements you know if, if you've got a phone that's i don't know four years old versus one that's come out yesterday you're, you're seeing the same stuff um but i think you're absolutely right and i think the, the dream that we really want is that you know if you've got a, a better device you get a better experience you can effectively do the equivalent of like upping your poly count just for for you because you know your device can take it um i think for me in terms of like the you know the, the dream the dream the sort of the end goal if we have more device compute um you know all of these areas could be improved like we're basically everything i've presented today would work so much better if you had an enormous server running it versus doing it on a little tiny phone um so that was one of the biggest lessons for me coming into mobile app development versus kind of offline development um but i think the dream yeah for like depth estimation for example we, we could do so much like getting like thin objects getting the making really sharp edges around the boundaries of things really recognizing moving objects and reconstructing them so we have this kind of really it's really like you're interacting with with a, a sort of hand designed mesh or depth map whereas at the moment you know because we're running on a phone we, at, at real time we kind of do everything fairly low resolution you know it's, it's it's good enough for doing most things in the game but there's always something you could do that if you had more compute um so yeah but it would be lazy to just wait for more compute so we have to also think cleverly and try and do what we can with computers out now Um, and did you ever test those new possibilities on the M1 chip, for example? Because I think this is giving the most um, power at the moment in mobile devices. I might be wrong, but I guess, I guess so, because they are enhancing AI possibilities of functionality so heavily in the last Yeah, week. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's absolutely what I, I haven't... I haven't tried anything out on it, but we, we kind of do the equivalent because we know what our algorithms, we can run them on the server and we kind of know, we can kind of say, hey, if in a hypothetical world where mobile phones were capable of doing this, this is what the outputs would look like. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I am very excited about kind of having this new technology that 
people can hold in their hands and run the kind of stuff that we see offline um, rather than the kind of uh, the sort of um, more realistic versions that we actually ship. Thanks. Anyone else? Another question. These are very good questions. Absolutely, I have to agree. Uh, I've, I mean, I've got, I've taken some notes. I could ask questions as well, if you still feel like it. <laughs> yeah, definitely, very happy to. Okay, um, well, I've really, uh, speaking of th uh, third party uh, developers and partners, um, Lots of the cases you've shown us were right now a kind of playful gamification mm. and uh, of course somehow. But do you already have, uh, or maybe to, to have it a bit more anonymous um, without calling names, but where do you see the greatest potential for the Lightship ARDK in other use cases than art and entertainment? Yeah, that was a good question. So Niantic actually, the first thing Niantic did wasn't Pokemon Go, it, it wasn't Ingress before that, it was Field Trip before that, which was not a game, it was effectively a geospatial Wikipedia. So as you walked around, it would kind of, your phone would say, hey, do you want to have a look down that, down that road there? Because there's something cool that you could see. Um, and you'd go and, and have a look at it, and it would tell you some information about it. Um, so again, you know, there's lots of this kind of tie in with geocaching, very sort of similar type concept. Um, and I think that's a really fun, um, thing still, like just to kind of see these kind of layers of could be history. It could be art. It could be just other things that, um, that other people have thought about this place and kind of to be able to access those layers, um, you know, to see to see, you know, a, a photo that someone wants to share of this of this place in winter when you're there in summer um, would be really fun. Um, but I think actually, you know, obviously, then you get into, well, what else could they are be good for? And there's, you know, education is obviously enormous, um, which I think is, is, is really fun. I think Niantic broadly, I don't see anything in the future for like, like for doing the kind of more um, how do you say, like enterprise type, um, like I think Microsoft with, with HoloLens, they really tackle the kind of, um, it's always a video of like a lift engineer fixing the lift um, or, um, or like fixing a car engine and being told how to do it, which part to pick up and so on. I don't think we're tackling those use cases. Um, it's very much like stuff that's anchored in the real world for people to do in a kind of it's, it is usually fun, right? In some way, even if it's fun of education and and learning and um, seeing labels, history, um, directions, perhaps um, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's not um, the one thing is not excluding the other. You can have fun while learning, actually. So exactly, be actually, pretty great. Um, someone else? Oh, yeah. Okay, another question by Wolf. When yeah. you start with pricing, will there be a free option for educational and academic institutions? It's a great assumption here from Rolf that there's going to be a pricing layer at some point. Um, I don't know anything about, um, about the um, future commercialization strategies, but I would say that Niantic does have a very strong um, heart with um, um, academic institutions because we are particularly the London Research Lab, we are born out of um, University College London and our the leader of the research lab is still a professor at um, UCL. So we have this kind of very strong connection to academia and I can fully imagine that, um, you know, we definitely want to not only give back, but also allow more people to use it, right? Because the more people that use it, the better. So I, I would strongly hope so, but I also don't know. Um, Thumbs up in the chat. Um, hello, can you hear me now? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. I, I had some audio issues. Also, I, I couldn't find the raise hand button, but anyway. So, um, yeah, I have a technical question, um, basically a follow up to the integration of AR Core and AR Kit. Um, so, um, how, like, um, uh, are you? 
considering phones that have like uh, advanced sensors um, or um, like uh, other like special features that um, yeah AR kit provides um, like uh, are you integrating any of those um, what could you give examples of what type of um, sensors or special yeah. features? Well, the LiDAR sensor, right, with the Apple. Yep. And um, also inside the AR kit, they already have their own version of like a semantic segmentation, which yep. has like a few labels available. So, but what is the difference, right? Where, where's the, how, how do you handle this? Yeah, so I think the important thing is that you still have access to all of that. So you can kind of pick and choose. You can, you can choose what you want for your application. Um, so if for something, you know, I know that in, yeah, AR kit, there's some um, human human parts, segmentation, human pose. Well, yeah, use that because we don't offer that. Um, I think the, the point is that it's a kind of, it's not an either or, you don't have to choose. Um, it's, um, but if you, yeah, it, it just gives you more options to use in your applications. Right, yeah, that's great, yeah. and. Um... I think that's also what other uh, like high level SDKs are doing. Like, uh, um, so um, like at a practical example, like let's say I have a Unity project, and then uh, uh, can I install uh, the AR kit, and then I install your uh, AR DK on top of that, and like use some features from one and one, some features from the other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So th that's that's, that's that's very important. You can definitely do that. Awesome. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> Anyone still got something on their minds? If not, I've still got plenty of notes left. No, but um, <laughs> I would just focus on two more questions that, uh, that I'm desperately to know the answer to, if that's fine with everyone. Okay. So, Michael, do you play Pokemon Go? Yes, I do, but, but I say not compared to like most people, um, <laughs> very little. Um, you know, I had more, I had more, I spent more time playing Catan actually when it, when we were, it was launched internally. I played mm -hmm. that a lot more. Um, and I think I just really enjoyed, I mean, obviously playing the board game and then playing that game. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. And what I really, you, you, we've been looking a bit into the future and uh, regarding the capabilities of Lightship IRDK. Does AR, uh, the AR DK right now support any smart glasses, for example? The HoloLens, I mean, um, there has been mm -hmm. this, I don't know, that promotional video with Microsoft's HoloLens. I yeah. think we all know that the HoloLens 2 is not really, well, what would drive mass adoption in smart glasses, but is it already a part of the AR DK? It's not a part of the AR DK but it's something that Niantic's super aware of because I think as you can, you know, as you probably see, saw from that video of Microsoft, right? Um, John Hankey, who's Niantic CEO, really believes in smart glasses as a, as a thing. Um, and, you know, so I think it's something we would be foolish if we, um, if we spent our time assuming that's in five years time, everyone would be doing AR on their phone still. So it's, it's not there now. But I think that, you know, I, I would personally hope that um, whatever AR device people use in the future, they'd be able to use the ARDK on it. I'd be looking forward to it, especially being a Pokemon Go player myself for five years straight now. So Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. As I mentioned initially, I'm a bit obsessed with uh, certain software products, but let's not dig deeper into this right now. So... Um, if no one else has uh, another question for Michael, um, I'd like to, on, uh, first of all, say thank you to Niantic, to Michael and Kid for reaching out, for being here, for sharing your time with us and giving us all these insights. And if any of you still feels like a bit of networking, like, I mean, we're not too many people left here right now, 14. 
um, we could start, I don't know, a little breakout session. And yeah, um, I don't know if you are all familiar with the concept of breakout sessions. It's kind of a random chat room. And yeah, so I'd enjoy that because, well, I miss events, as I mentioned earlier. But if no one is up for it, just, we, I mean, we could start it. Michael, do you still have time or are yeah. you in a rush? Absolutely, and not, no rush at all. Cool. So, uh, Sarah, could you yeah. just start a, I don't know, maybe six yeah. people breakout session? Yeah, I Let's just see what's make... happening then and how many people will leave us then. Yeah, <laughs> I'll make two rooms. Two Before rooms. we do it, I have to say thank you to everyone who's invited us along and, um, and for hosting, hosting us here and for doing such a good job of, you know, this kind of virtual uh, table we sat behind and just making it very smooth, uh, uh, seamless, um, you know, it was all done. Thank Very you. Awesome. Thank it's you. been a pleasure. And if you ever end up in Hamburg, um, give us a call. We'll show you around, uh, not only through the miniature Wunderland, but also everything else there is to see regarding XR technologies. Very cool. Thank you very much.